think about Pentecost a few minutes ago, and you saw that little video, and the, um, the fact that everyone who heard those disciples speaking could understand what they were saying. And you know, there's a sort of parallel here between what we do here and what happened then. As I stand here and speak, I guarantee that most of you will pick up something different to each other from what I say, okay? I'll be interested to find out, actually, afterwards, if you do. But I, I actually suspect that that is true, because I know from talking to other people, sermons, and listening to them, and then talking to them afterwards, that different people pick up different things. And that's how God speaks to us. So let me pray for us before we start. Heavenly Father, guide our thoughts and our actions this morning. May the words that I speak be honouring to you and helpful for our learning, and help each one of us to take something away and learn from our time together this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder, have you noticed how things change? Even Laylam is changing right now. The installation of the new fuel line to Heathrow up the Ashford Road, causing massive problems with traffic. The massive extension to Shepparton Studios. None of these things will remain the same. They evolve. And the same is true of our lives, isn't it? Our first self-awareness as a child, when we see things through the eyes of a child. And then, gradually, as we grow up and see things in a more adult way, things changed. And this is expressed in our passage with a word that appears in many places. I counted the number of occasions it occurs in those few verses that Anne read to us. It's a total of 30 times in that passage. Can you guess what that word is? Come on. Can you guess what that word is? Time. Great. Well done. Yes, it is. So we get the impression, don't we, that the writer here, most probably Solomon, is trying to get us to think about time. So what is time? We measure it continuously, don't we? Most of you will have an instrument that measures its passing on your wrist. I do. It's called a watch. But what is time? How do we define it? We know how to measure it, don't we? It's related to the way our world behaves. The scientists measured it by the period of rotation of the Earth, perhaps which defines the day, or the period in which the moon travels around the earth, which defines the month, approximately, and the period of the earth's travel around the sun, which defines the year. We have atomic clocks too, don't we, that measure extremely accurately the passage of time through the frequency at which a cesium crystal close to uh, zero, minus 273 degrees, oscillates. But we find it hard to define, don't we? Now, if you're a physicist like me, you'll know that in the theory of relativity, we understand that time and space are closely related. And as you approach the speed of light, time itself starts to change. But I'm not going to give you a physics lecture this morning, so don't worry. My dictionary suggests that time is, listen to this, a non-spatial continuum in which events occur in apparently irreversible succession from the past through the present to the future. Pardon? What was all that about? I don't get it quite. Maybe you do. But here's an interesting one. Penned by St. Augustine of Hippo many thousands of years ago. What then is time, he says. If no one asks me, I know what it is. If I wish to explain it to him... Who asks? I don't know. (laughs) And isn't that true of most of us? We sort of intuitively know what time is. And yet, if somebody asks you to explain it, it's quite difficult. Yet God, you know, in creating us, and the universe for that matter, has arranged for us to be locked into a sequence of events which define our lives from beginning to end, separated by intervals of time. We're powerless to escape from this, We cannot step out of this sequence. We may want to. We can see this perhaps in the desire from fiction 
For example, in Star Wars or Doctor Who, some of these sci-fi thrillers where people travel in time. I hardly dare mention this, but I will because it might amuse you. And from my youth, a fictional character called Dan Dare, who used to travel around in a spaceship called Anastasia in a magazine called The Eagle, which is lo- no long... Oh, somebody's nodding here. One or two, one or two remember it. My goodness. I tried it on the, uh, I tried it on the 9th of 15 congregation this morning, and they were all nodding and saying, yeah, I remember. <laughs> Dates me a bit, doesn't it? But never mind. Here is a desire, you see, to step out of time. And we can see it in the mind of the author in our passage, too. First, through the many opposites he cites, in which verses 1 to 8, which define our lives. For example, in verse 2, and if you've got the Bible open in front of you, it might help. A time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot. And through the statement he makes right at the beginning, there is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. Just like today, which is the season we call Pentecost, as we've heard, when we remember the first coming of God's Spirit to the disciples around 2,000 years ago. What I think the author is trying to get us to see here is that we are locked into this sequence of time. That is how God has designed the world and indeed the whole universe. However, in contrast... God himself is not locked into this. He is outside it all. And he has three attributes that I'd like to look at quickly. First of all, God is eternal. We can perhaps see this from our passage this morning, where the author says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. That's verse 14, if you cast your eyes down towards the bottom of the passage that Anne read. But it's clearer from the start of the ba- Bible even more, because the first few words of the Bible in the book of Genesis read like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, from which we can infer that as the creator, he must have existed before the earth was made. And then, from the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, we get a view of the end of everything. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Once again, God continues to exist, part of the new heaven. So whilst the earth and all creation have a beginning and an end and are locked into this passage of time, God, in some way we can't fully understand, is outside it. Second, God doesn't change. Our passage tells us in verse 14, I know that everything God does will endure. It won't change. And we can see from verses 1 to 8 of our passage that everything else around us changes. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity. But God doesn't. If you want another scripture to reinforce that, turn to the book of James, in verse, chapter 1, verse 17. So we learn that God is timeless. He doesn't... Sorry, let me read that passage to you. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father, who does not change like shifting shadows. Do you get it? He doesn't change. He doesn't live within the constraints of time like we do. He doesn't change like we do. He is changeless and permanent. And third, and very simply, God is just. Look right down to the bottom of the passage, verse 15. The last few words. God will call the past to account. God will deal with all wrongdoing. Bring everyone to explain all they have done in their lives and judge their lives accordingly. So we have a God who is outside time, who is eternal, doesn't change, and is totally just. Yet, he has so designed creation and ourselves who inhabit time with all its limitations. And as we read through our passage, we see all these opposites which cover the different elements of our lives, birth and death, joy and sadness, love and hate, war and peace. Once having grasped that we are locked into the sequence of time, 
and that God is eternal and doesn't change. The author of our passage tells us some other things that God wants for us. First, he says in verse 11, God has made everything beautiful in its time. We have been made so that we can appreciate the beauty of God's creation. For example, the beauty of our world. Have you seen that picture taken from uh, from the moon of the earth? complete in a big circle with a beautiful colour. It's glorious. I wish I could have put it on the screen for you, but I couldn't. But the earth itself is beautiful. Then he goes on to tell us a little bit later in verse 11, he, that is God, has also set eternity in the hearts of men. What does that mean? That's interesting, isn't it? It appears that even though we are locked into the sequence of events that make up our lives, God also seems to have placed within us a desire to step out of that time sequence in which he has placed us, to understand concepts such as infinity, eternity, and understand more about who God is and how he works. But as we've seen, we're powerless to do so in this life. For, as verse 11 tells us, Men cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. So God seems to have placed us in a situation where we have a desire to see the bigger picture, but not enabling us to always to do so. And in so doing, my friends, he wants us to be content through putting our trust in him for those things we presently cannot understand and to find contentment in so doing. Our desire to be like God himself, to have the understanding, control and authority of God, to which many of us would aspire in this world, is not God's plan for us in this world. That will come later, once this life is past. When those of us who put our trust in God and believe in what his son Jesus has done for us, through his life, death and resurrection, will receive permanence in heaven. It is perhaps why God has placed on our hearts the desire to see the bigger picture we looked at earlier. Although the author knew nothing of Jesus and what he was to do when he wrote this book. For the moment, however, however much we want to escape from being locked into the sequence we call time, we can't. We cannot step out of that sequence and see the things from God's point of view, let alone become God ourselves. No, God wants us to be content. He wants us to find contentment in the situations in which he has placed us in our lives on this earth. We can see this as our, in the mind of the author of our passage. Look with me at verses 12 and 13, if you've got your Bibles open, <clears throat> or even if you're looking at them on your phone. I know that there is nothing better for men maybe we should say people today, than to be happy and do good while they live, that everyone may eat, drink, and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. So, my friends, how do we find this contentment? First note the last few words. It is the gift of God. We cannot find this on our own. God will give it to us if we place our trust in him and allow his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, the coming of which, of course, we remember today. Second, note that we might gain contentment by doing good to others, not through giving in to our own selfish desires. So often the case these days, isn't it? We live in a me-first generation. Today's culture wants to be what I want, not what you want. Do you know the joy of helping others? I hope you do, for that is what we should be doing, inspired by the Holy Spirit, for each other and those outside the church as part of God's family, the church. Speaking personally, I still derive joy from helping others through the work I do both here in Laleham and as a chaplain at Heathrow Airport. I find joy in doing things for other people rather than 
satisfying my own desires. Thirdly, God has placed us here to find satisfaction in our work. Some work of itself can be incredibly boring, can't it? But if we realise that we're doing it for the glory of God and not just to earn money, although that is important too, then that changes the picture somewhat. I know a number who clean toilets for a living in Heathrow. One of them is a Christian. And that person enjoys their work. They make the toilets sparkling clean. They do it to the best of their ability. Not for their employer's benefit particularly, but for God. And as a result, there is always a smile on that person's face when I meet them. They derive joy from knowing that they they work for the Lord in the work they do. I wonder if there's something there for us. So I return to my theme. God has set us in a sequence in which we are born, live, love, work, and eventually die. This is how he has designed us to be. And we are more content if we follow his design, empowered by his Holy Spirit. Let me look again at those sequences in verses 1 to 8 of our passage from another viewpoint for a moment. I have four simple points. First, life is repetitive. Look with me at verse 15 for a moment. Whatever is, has already been, and what will be, has been before. What on earth does that mean, I can hear you ask? Well, to me, this indicates that life can be repetitive to some extent. It is sequential, as we have seen, and we cannot go backwards in time. But there are repetitions, the seasons on an annual cycle. We celebrate festivals like Easter, Christmas, Pentecost even today, and birthdays too, don't we? They give us a sense of belonging in a world of ongoing change. For in the end, we long for permanence, don't we? Yeah? Do you agree? Silence. Okay, good. We long for permanence in a world of change. Verse 11 tells us that, if you have a look. Repetition can give us some comfort in this area, for a cycle of seasons can give us a sense of continuity as they repeat year after year. A sense of reassurance may be against that desire for permanence we have, which will come later. Second, God has also designed our lives to be rhythmical, You can see perhaps rhythm in the contrasts in verses 1 to 8. A time to do this, a time to do that. We find this too early in the scriptures. For example, in Exodus, we read God telling Moses that six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Wise people repeat life's rhythms that God has set. For example, work six days and rest one, because that's God's plan. I remember some decades ago now, the Soviet Union, as it was then, decided for efficiency reasons to go for a ten-day week. So it was one day in ten was rest. What happened? Everybody fell apart, because we're not designed to be like that. And people started getting all sorts of illnesses, mental ones particularly. We take holidays, too. In the scripture, they're called holy days, resting from daily work. You know, we depart from these rhythms at our peril. It's what God has designed us to do. And I think one of the biggest perils in our day and age, believe it or not, is IT. We live in a world of instant response. I've even got a mobile phone in my pocket, yeah? When it goes off, you pick it up, you look at it, don't you? Yes, I must answer that message. It's not God's way, you know. We don't need to have instant responses. Sometimes those responses are wrong. I remember I used to say to my staff in London, when we first started to get computers, my goodness, that ages me a bit, doesn't it? It's over 20 years ago now. I said to them, put the thing you've written in the draft box and leave it there overnight 
don't press the send button until the next morning. And I guarantee in nine out of ten cases, you will change it the next morning. No, God doesn't want us to gallop at these things. The rhythm is what we need that God has provided for us. And I'm beginning now to have the same concern, by the way, for artificial intelligence, which is all in the papers now, as you've probably seen. No, contentment is to be found in living life God's way and letting his word and his spirit be the key pointers in the rhythms of our lives. <clears throat> Thirdly, God, life is relational. Our times are marked by relationships, aren't they? How many of those functions in verses 1 to 8 can we do without others? We can't be born without others, can we? We can't love without others. We can't hate either, for that matter. We can't embrace someone without others. We often weep and laugh together. No point in speaking if there isn't somebody there to listen. And making war and seeking peace are also impossible without relationship. This is God's intention for us. God not only wants us to relate to him, but to each other too. And he gives us his Holy Spirit to help us to do so. Our relationships in our families, in the church family too, are some of the most precious we have. My friends, it's why we weep when someone we know dies. Or share the joy in the birth of a new baby, even if it's not our own. We share joy, don't we, in meeting someone who's got new life in their family. And finally, life is ordered. God has a plan for our lives. Our contentment and effectiveness is mostly to be found in following God's word, listening to his spirit, guiding us to do good things. It's why I think the author says in verse 12, I know there is nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live. It happens that my, my uh, Bible version hasn't been degenderized. I apologize for that. But it means nothing better for people than to be happy and do good while they live. So, my friends, what relevance does all this stuff from Scripture's so-called wisdom literature have for us today? The first eight verses, all those contrasts, describe our experience quite accurately today, don't they? Despite being written more than 3,000 years ago. We, too, know there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the sun. So the conclusion they come to about the burden that is placed on people in verse 10 is not dissimilar to ours today. We've also seen that the God who made us and the world we inhabit is eternal and doesn't change and is just. And we know from other parts of scripture, which I'm afraid I don't have time to delve into now, that God loves us. How do we know this? Well, We've gone wrong, haven't we? At the beginning of this service, we confessed our sins, the things we've done wrong. Because we haven't followed God's plan for our lives, we've tried to be like God ourselves. So we can see that in some of the contrasts in our passage, we can see that sinfulness, can't we? Which refer to killing, hate, war and things like that. However, today, we have one enormous, life-changing benefit over the author of this book. We have life in a way which Solomon could not have understood. We now know Jesus and who he is and what he has done. We have the Son that God sent to guide and to teach us more, to allow us through his death and resurrection to have our sins forgiven and to come close to his Father. So that when judgment comes, and my friends, it will, we only need to look two verses beyond the passage that Anne read for us in your scriptures this morning to see that very, very clearly. I won't read them, but have a look at them, and you'll see what I mean. We will be found, but when that happens, and judgment comes, through belief and trust is Jesus, we will be found not guilty. We can be certain 
of our place in heaven when we die, so that when this life is past, we can go and live with him, that is, with God, forever. Here, perhaps, is the reason why the author of our passage saw that God had set eternity in the hearts of men. Verse 11. You see, unlike the author, God knew that one day he was going to send Jesus so that if we believed and trusted in him, we could go and live with him in the place the book of Revelation describes as a new heaven and a new earth. He set that longing in our hearts when he designed us. Such knowledge and certainty can bring us great comfort and contentment now for the situation in which we find ourselves today. The understanding that this life, which comes to an end when we die, is not all there is. There is more and much, much better to come, including an eternal permanence in God's presence once this life is over. I quote, or rather misquote, from Winston Churchill. See if you like this. You see, death is not the end, nor is it the the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Do you get it? You see, this life, we're locked in time as it is. It is merely a preparation and a testing ground for eternity spent in God's presence hereafter for those who believe and trust in what Jesus has done for us. Also, for now, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit to help us face up to the challenges of living the life that God plans for us on this earth, with all its trials and tribulations, its highs and lows described in our passage. In summary, then, whilst our lives are presently restricted to living in time, God, our creator, is eternal outside time, and never changes. He has a plan he wants us to follow in this life, noting that it can be repetitive but finite, rhythmical, relational, and ordered. He is also the righteous judge who will judge us at its end. But because of what Jesus has done in his life and death and resurrection, when that judgment comes, we will be found not guilty. And therefore, we can have certainty now of being with him in heaven once this life is past. Through this and our longing for eternity, which we have seen God has built into us, a certainty we can have, which can bring us great comfort here and now. Meanwhile, in living through the seasons of this life, we don't have to be stressed, trying to shoulder the burden of doing too much. God wants us to find contentment in following him obeying his word and guidance, knowing that he has ordained the times of our lives with a time for everything. He wants us to find joy in his good gifts, such as our food and drink, fulfillment in doing good to others, satisfaction in our work, and joy from helping others. And enjoy worshipping him too, as we are doing this morning here, on this special day of the year, when we remember the coming of his Holy Spirit. Let me finish with a prayer. Heavenly Father, on this day when we remember especially the coming of your Holy Spirit, help us to live this life as you would wish, following your rhythms and timescales, enjoying your good gifts and seeking to do good to others. May we find contentment in so doing, safe in the knowledge that through belief and trust in your Son Jesus and what he has done, we can be certain of a place in your presence forever once this life is past. In Jesus' name.